Here, this way. <laughs> It's him. Uh, rub some acid in his eyes. Oh, that'll refresh yeah. him up. Ah, <coughs> oh, good lord! This is not the wake-up service I asked for. Well, it's been quite a while since I last played this game. I want to say about a decade, but honestly, I'm not quite sure. I just know that I was a lot younger, so I was curious what my older sensibilities would make of it. And to head anyone off at the pass before they assume I'm about to tear it to shreds. I like, I like this, this game. game. I, I enjoyed, enjoyed playing, playing it. it. It is fun. It made me chuckle. Nothing, Nothing I say in this video should be taken as me trying, trying to cancel it. Right, now that that's out of the way. I am being genuine when I say I like this game. There aren't enough games where you play as the bad guy and I appreciate its existence. Giving it the comedic tone of a pantomime was a positive move insofar as it let the game get away with things that would have absolutely landed in an M rating if it were played straight. As it is, the game has a T rating, thanks in large part to its levity and slightly goofy aesthetics. The game does not take itself seriously and you aren't supposed to either. You play as your typical evil overlord in a generic fantasy setting, a discount Sauron with his horde of diminutive minions rather than orcs. The minions are half the charm of the game, zero brain cell little gremlins completely loyal to your command who wear anything they pick up on their heads as you pillage your way through the realm, including, but not limited to, rats, sheep, crowns, skulls, mining helmets, slugs, etc. They are just little guys who will tear apart anything you point them at. While you are doubtless an overlord, the game doesn't force you to do anything you don't want to most of the time anyway, we'll get to that, and offers the player choices that either increase your level of corruption or decrease it. High corruption leads to the player looking demonic with burning eyes, dark armor, and spikes growing out of their skin, while low corruption results in glowing blue eyes, shiny bright armor, and no unexpected protrusions. We're going to cover the low corruption version of the story, but I will absolutely go into more detail about just how bad you can be later in the video. Let's get started. We begin our journey in a tomb with voices clamoring outside. The light breaks in as minions remove the heavy lid and acid is promptly rubbed in our eyes to freshen us up. Nal, an old and experienced minion who fills the role of advisor, informs us that we've been asleep for a very long time, which is the diplomatic way to say that you are absolutely undead and they've risen you from the grave as a vessel for the forces of darkness. It's explained to us that the chamber below the tower is the spawning pit where new minions are born and housed. You can either learn how to fight or get right to the meat of the game if you've played before, but I hadn't in quite a while and needed the reminder, so we're taught the finer points of minion control using the Jester as a training dummy. The Jester is a non-combat minion who stays in the tower and does exactly what his name implies. He jingles miserably around the main room, announcing all your deeds throughout the game as titles such as Leader of the Firestarters, Exploder of Melvin Underbelly, Merciful Quietener of the Grumbling Stomachs, Peasant Protector, Bully of Jesters. Nal remarks about meddlesome heroes killing our predecessor and looting and pillaging the tower, but gleefully continues that evil always finds a way. And now that you're here as the new and third overlord, evil can flourish again. Since the tower has been left to the elements for years, we're going to have to get some home renovation going, and I don't think Extreme Makeover House Edition makes evil tower cool, so we're going to have to DIY this. Our first job is to reclaim the tower heart, which powers the tower portal and fuels your magic. Thankfully, the portal has just enough energy to take us where the heart was last seen, and we emerge into the idyllic landscape of Meadow Hills. This tranquil wilderness, so rural and idyllic, hideous, is it not? Try not to inhale it, my lord. Killing the local sheep for their life force, we move through the area to find Farmer Bob, a strange T-posing man who hears pumpkins speaking to him and asks us to kill both them and the harflings. Those ain't harflings. Ruining his life. 
After getting rid of the harflings, Bob points us in the direction of Spree while ruminating on growing marrows because they don't talk. Maybe grow marrows instead. Yeah, marrows don't talk so much. Yeah, that'd be nice. On the way to Spree, however, we find that the Harflings have been using the Tower Heart to grow extra big pumpkins, which we promptly relieve them of. Gnarl remarks that the black clouds we can see rising from the dead Harflings is evil energy that gathers in all evil creatures, which we'll learn more of in time. We return the Tower Heart, increasing the number of minions we can summon and regaining the use of the Fireball spell, of which Gnarl comments that he's a robust fellow and it's no surprise he made it. Hmm. Anyways, Gnarl can't go out with us again because he's allergic to birdsong and we head out again to retrieve the tower objects that we need to properly rebuild the place. At Spree, we're stopped by the villagers who will only let us in if we prove we're not halflings in a trench coat and free their men from the work camps nearby. Swinging and incinerating our way through said camps grants us access to a crane we can use to repair the tower and earns us entry into Spree. Inside, we're greeted by one of the two black men in the game, a portly mayor and tavern keeper called Archie from the Ruborian Desert, who sounds like an American despite Ruboria being vaguely Middle Eastern looking in the broadest possible terms, because there is just no world consistency in the first game. I'll have to get back to you on the second game. Archie implores us to retrieve the food stolen from them by the halflings, and we head off to do just that, getting a look at the first boss of the game and... Oh boy, I can't wait for the comedy around this. The gate to Melvin is currently closed, so instead we fight our way through the Hobbit homes, sorry, Halfling homes, looting plenty of gold, some tower objects, and freeing captive villages that the Halflings were absolutely going to cook and serve to him. After navigating our way through the second half of this dungeon without being overwhelmed, we find the food and send our minions to pick it up. It's here we get our first real choice in the game, to keep the food for 50 life force and kill the witnesses, or return the stolen food and get the long-term benefit of more sheep in the area every time you return keeping in mind that sheep give life force. Now, despite the peasants starving without it, if you return the food, you're given the notification that you selflessly returned the food to the fat peasants. Peak comedy to someone, I'm sure. Emerging from the homes, the gate to Melvin drops open and we proceed to the party area where we are treated to a much closer view of the former hero. <laughs> Looks like Melvin is making a run for it. Well, a waddle for it. A character's sin is gluttony, and you make them a gross, slovenly, fatty, fat person who farts as they walk and has their ass hanging out. Groundbreaking. Yes, this game is from 2007, and its sense of humor very much shows it. I know it doesn't take itself seriously, but comedy is one of the first things to date itself and age poorly. And some parts of this game definitely aged worse than others, in my opinion. I guess the less snowflake way to criticize this is that it's just very lazy shorthand to visualize gluttony, which isn't the sin of fatties, but a hoarding of resources at the expense of the needy. And if you want to stick to food, there were specific outlines for what counted as gluttonous behavior. <clears throat> Eating before the designated time to satisfy the palate, caught snacking, eternal damnation. Seeking delicacies or just a better quality of food to gratify the vile sense of taste. Want to eat something better than gruel and hardtack? A storm of putrefaction for you. Seeking to stimulate the palate with overly prepared food with luxurious sauces or seasonings. Is that some motherfucking paprika? Flayed for all time by the claws of the great worm exceeding the necessary quantity of food. Have you got too much bread like the city of Sodom? Perish! Taking food with too much eagerness, even when eating the right amount, at the right time, at the right level of luxury, that is to say, none at all. How dare you desire anything? Grovel in putrid mud till the end of time. Like, none of this is about the actual food itself, it's about pleasure, enjoying and desiring the satisfaction that comes from eating nice food. Pleasure seeking in itself is considered the evil because Sky Daddy said so. There are plenty of creatures you could have taken design inspiration from throughout mythology, creatures that are based around hunger and famine, and many of them are skeletal or otherwise wasting away to represent a hunger that can never be satisfied, a desire that is never satisfied. 
The Fear Gorta, the hungry man of Ireland, is an emaciated corpse. Jiki Ninki, a Japanese human eating ghost, is described as a shapeless figure. Prita, a hungry ghost of Hinduism, is described as human like with sunken, mummified skin, narrow limbs, distended bellies, and thin necks. And one I'm sure you've heard of before, the Windigo of Algonquin-speaking peoples, who is not, in fact, a deer-headed cryptid, but is described by the Ojibwe thusly. The Windigo is gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones. With its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash grey of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into its sockets. The Windigo looked like a gaunt skeleton, recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, unclear and suffering from the separation of flesh. The Windigo gave off a strange and eerie odour of decay and decomposition, of death and corruption. There are other descriptions such as a heart of ice, burning eyes, and a fully fleshed creature that grows in proportion to what it eats, ensuring it can never be satisfied. While no one should just be copy-pasting this particular myth without care, I bring it up just as an example of a monster related to famine and starvation. But despite any other direction they could have gone, the only thing the team for Overlord could come up with was Fat people are gross, please laugh. Anyway, we enter Melvin's lair, the halfling kitchens, and discover that they've been using the red minions as fire starters to cook all the food they make for him. Promptly freeing the reds, we turn Melvin's cooks into charred brisket and proceed to the first boss battle where... Melvin ain't so small now. <laughs> Oh, for f**k's sake. So anyway, his main form of attack is to pinball his way around the room because he's fat and you need to sweep your minions out of the way or risk losing most or all of them. Once he's brought to low health, Narl prompts you to burst him like a balloon while he wiggles helplessly on the floor, showering the chamber in filth and bile and also concentrated evil energy. After allowing your minions to grab Melvin's crown and scepter, we head further in to retrieve the Red Hive and bring it back to the tower, allowing us to summon Red Minions, who can absorb fire to destroy flaming obstacles, and have a ranged attack useful for striking from high ground or hitting flying enemies. They are also naturally immune to fire. Upon returning to Mellow Hills after Melvin's defeat, a local shepherd tells us that the sheep are flourishing and breeding faster than she can count them, so we can take as many as we like. Sweet. However, with Raising Hell installed, we come upon a strangely angelic-looking gate that's now luring your peasants away with its heavenly appearance and gentle choir echoing from within. If you haven't gone to the dark side, it's kind of odd that the villagers want to escape their dark overlord when all you've done so far to conquer the region is free their enslaved friends and family, return their stolen food so they don't starve, slay the cannibalistic halfling lord who was eating them, and just in general made their lives better and safer. Like, the only thing that kind of makes sense is the sheep killing, but we were literally just told to take as many as we want, explicitly because there's now a big surplus of them. So what are the villagers running from here? But anyway, we'll get back to this strange gate business once the main story is dealt with. After retrieving the smelter from the last bit of untarnished farmland Spree has left, we proceed through another gate that leads to Castle Spree, which we're told is under attack by demons that just popped out of the air, with the mention of a mysterious lady who told the people there to run. Arriving at Castle Spree, things seem to be a bit on fire, and we're attacked by strange black-clad raiders. Once inside, we meet the mysterious lady mentioned before, a red-headed woman called Rose, who is direct, sharp as a dagger, and very keen on keeping things orderly. She was attempting to help the people fleeing from a plague affecting a place called Heaven's Peak, but the raiders interrupted her efforts, so now she needs us to deal with them and retrieve her luggage, if we'd be so kind. Before we go, Rose warns that the raiders had a strange magical creature with them, and we fight our way through the castle to find that they do indeed have a legally distinct beholder, allowing them to teleport where they need to go. After bullying the thing to death with our red minions, we retrieve Rose's luggage and get it back to her. She's thankful for the retrieval and expresses pleasant surprise at our proficiencies, declaring that someone like us could use someone like her. I mean, it's not like the Overlord isn't already great at following orders. 
So anyway, we return to the tower, now fully repaired, and time for Rose to move in as our mistress, opening up the private quarters. The upper levels of the tower contain a bedroom, a free space to customize later, a treasure hoard, and a study where you can customize the tower's look. One particular thing of note is that if you change the banners, you change the color of the wrap on your shoulders, so that's neat. Urged by Rose to investigate what's causing the plague at Heaven's Peak, we head out to find a full-blown zombie apocalypse in progress. Unfortunately, there's no way into this city without the blue minions, who we can't reach without the greens, so the only other place we can go is the Cursed Forest of Evernight, the path to which we unblock using the reds because it was on fire for some reason? Okay. Yes, I know that it's for gameplay reasons, shush. Narl fills us in that the forest used to be lovely and harmonious, but has become dark and corrupted, and we learn from elven ghosts this is the aftermath of a genocide perpetrated against them by the dwarves. Their hero, Oberon, suffers the sin of sloth, and there's not that much to say about him. He's the least outwardly malicious of the heroes, and was encouraged to rest in the aftermath of his group's clash with the second overlord, whereupon he just fell into a mystic coma and couldn't be woken up even when the dwarves invaded and began slaughtering elven kind. The forest merged with his sleeping body and brought his nightmares to life in a desperate attempt to stop the slaughter, which worked only for his nightmares to rage out of control and kill the remaining elves who weren't taken as slave labor by the dwarves. By the time we reach him, the tree is starting to burrow into his brain, so killing him is more of a mercy than anything else, and his death reveals a passage to the Golden Hills where the dwarves live. During all of this, we retrieve the green minions, the stealthy, stabby, and apparently smelly ones of the bunch, who turn invisible when you set them to guard an area, are immune to toxins, and can absorb poisonous obstacles to clear the way for you. Neat. In order to actually reach Oberon, however, we need to track down all the big glowing nodes scattered around the forest, and in order to reach all of the nodes, we need to retrieve the blue minion, so back to Heaven's Peak we go. Hustling through the refugee camp, we get a hint of what's behind the plague when we run into a succubus and a huge neon red sign as to what the sin of the next fallen hero is. It's definitely wrath. The blue minion hive is my least favorite to do, chiefly because the blue minions are basically the healers in your merry band of gremlins and can't fight worth a damn unless their target is a magical creature. They can move through water and resurrect fallen minions, but they do almost no damage otherwise and die very easily. This section is annoying, is what I'm getting at. With all the minion tribes at our command, we can finally get through the watery areas and open pathways for our less water-inclined gremlins. Back at Evernight, we navigate through the Mother Goddess Temple in search of another node, and... We guard their rest until the day when they shall rise and reclaim our fallen kingdom. It seems that the tombs hold the key to this place. Be thankful for the foolishness of others. We get to the end of the temple in time to see a black lady called Jewel, who talks like she just walked off a Californian campus. Unfortunately for her thieving envy, the dwarves beat her to stealing the recently genocided species sacred goddess statue, so she calls an Uber to escape. Before she can leave though, a massive warrior called Khan emerges from the overseer's teleportation spell. <laughs> Honey, love muffin, I found you. You mustn't use the overseer, Snuggle Bottom. The old man don't like it. Clearly, I didn't hit you hard enough. Jew, I don't like you beaming off like that, my little thieving sugar plum. Just stop talking. It makes Khan angry. Look what you did. Come on, you great lug. Let's go. So, what they've done here is represent the Sin of Wrath with a huge, physically imposing, bald black man who refers to himself in the third person, has rage issues, and appears to have a controlling and questionably violent relationship towards the only black woman in the game, who represents the Sin of Envy and steals anything and everything other people take joy in having. I'm not unpacking this, I'm just throwing out the entire suitcase. We cut the last of the roots and kill Oberon, now back to Heaven's Peak we go! <laughs> Making our way through the city sewers, we fight through an obscene amount of bullshit until we finally emerge into the city proper, where the scant few survivors within are being protected by knights who really don't appreciate our presence here. 
After opening the main gate to let people out, we're informed by one of the survivors that all this started when Sir William returned from his last crusade, and the situation has gotten so out of hand they even had to cancel the royal wedding. Now, based on absolutely no other information, Rose chimes in to assume that the woman getting married is some young harlot with full breasts and an empty head, which is giving I'm not like other girls energy, a bold choice for the devs given how casually misogynistic their Wish.com fantasy setting is. Upon seeing a poster of Sir William and his would-be wife, Rose immediately doubles down on her comment because it's her sister, Velvet, not that she tells us that right away. Clearing out the zombies, beating up the knights, and becoming the new god of the local religious weirdos who stitch their own mouths shut, we end up in the basement levels of the Halfway to Heaven Inn, where there's clearly some kind of freaky sex cult shenanigans going on. And guys, devs, if you're going to make a sex cult, whole ass it, don't do this cowardly, weak middle ground of female characters having their tits and thighs out while the men are fully covered. Commit to it, or don't do it at all, otherwise you just come off as massively insecure. At the end of this debauched dungeon, we fight and kill the Queen's Succubus Sir William summoned because his horniness breached containment and subsequently put an end to the plague affecting Heaven's Peak. With that out of the way, we head up to Angelus Keep high above the city and confront the perverted paladin behind it all. You! You! Didn't we leave you for dead in that godforsaken tower? Huh. He recognizes you. Now why would that be? As hysterical as I find his voice, I only just noticed the, um, symbolism on the banners hanging around his lair? Hmm. Sir William is kind of annoying to fight since he keeps running away all the while lamenting how he wasted so much time helping people when he could have been having fun and like, man, if pain and pleasure is what you wanted, given your would-be wife's entire vibe, if you had just asked, she absolutely would have and called you her nasty little if that's what you were after. There was no need for all this. Anyway, we deliver a horny bat from God and watch Sir William come to an explosive finish. <laughs> Using his staff to fix a broken wheel, we open the locked door to his personal chambers and find his would-be wife, Velvet. Well, hello, dark stranger. The rumors do not do you justice. You've brought me a gift. Some little pixies. You really shouldn't have. Next time, make it something shiny and expensive. Now, let me thank you properly. She's obviously fine. She can find her own way out. Ooh, she's quite the tasty treat, sire. Now, the Overlord is a loyal boy and does not replace Rose with her goth sister as much as that pains me aesthetically, but this whole situation is part of the casual sexism aged like milk, because this game was absolutely made with the presumption that only hormonal pubescent straight boys would play it because vidi game. The Overlord is male, all the minions are male, and most of the NPCs and all but one of the bosses are male. Your only major-ish female presence is your chosen mistress and the Envy boss, a black woman. Narl's remark on Velvet being a tasty treat <laughs> lamenting that the tower can only accommodate one mistress at a time, and the gameplay benefits that either sister can confer just makes them feel like trophies to collect. They are trophies. They're called your mistress, not your wife or anything else, with a less carnal or more equal designation. I don't know. It just rubs me the wrong way. Once you return to the tower after this decision, your chosen mistress calls you up to the chambers for what is absolutely a sex scene that a couple of your minions scramble to peep on, and I'll just... I'll just let this play. I have diagrams, charts, and a pot of tea on. Do come in. Now you take the... Nice. And some of... And you scream. Total annihilation. Get something sharp. Right in the... Pencil manoeuvre! And that's how you do it, sire. Good luck. Ow! Oh, and they were roommates. Oh my 
God, they were roommates. Moving on to the Golden Hills, King Goldo is the next boss here, and his sin is that of greed. A hunger for gold and riches led to his invasion of the Elven Kingdom, and I am not a fan of his boss fight, as he spends most of it in a contraption called Roly. We slash and burn our way through increasingly annoying enemies, i.e. the flamethrower dwarves, stealing their beer kettle, infiltrating the mother goddess statue because it's apparently hollow inside, so when Jewel shows up to steal it, our minions can discover a way to her lair, and bring about a decisive conclusion to the elves v dwarves situation. I am well aware that it is probably meant to be a nod to the haha elves and dwarves hate each other thing that we got handed down from Tolkien, but the dwarves having actually committed genocide and enslavement of the elves to the point that they've completely separated the women from the men so they can't reproduce and the women are kept as gold as concubines and if you don't free the women the elves will straight up die out and putting all this in the context of a pantomime level setting is um it, it, it's choice, for sure. And I know it's not that deep, but again, this just rubs me the wrong way. Our minions from the statue find and activate a gate to the Reborian Desert where Jewel is from, which is my least favorite region in the game owing to the killer sandworms and the impassable bone walls you need to destroy by luring exploding beetles over to them. It just feels like padding and tedium. As mentioned before, Jewel's sin is envy to the point where she'll steal anything other people have down to a child's teddy bear, and as the only black woman in the game, making her a spiteful, envious thief who is driven to steal whatever other people get joy and value from rolls casual misogyny together with a potent shot of misogynoir. Jewel is the only boss we don't fight, but rather corral her into the tower gate for capture, in a section that was needlessly annoying as she would just completely ignore minion placements and run right past them instead of away, but eventually we capture her because she has information we want. Why are you running? Head her off with your minions, sire. The Hello there. One eternity later. What? All the way back in Evernight Forest, the elven ghosts asked you to return the Mother Goddess statue, and after chasing this thing for most of the game, you finally get to either return it or keep it as a tower ornament. Naturally, I gave it back. Returning to the tower, Jewel is interrogated to find out who she is working with, and we discover that the man behind it all is in fact the wizard. We can't get more out of her, however, because her lover Khan attacks, angry about Jewel's capture. Obviously, Khan's sin is wrath, he is the angry black man trope, and we have to stop him from rampaging across Spree and Heaven's Peak before he kills all our worshippers. <laughs> Called back to the tower, we're confronted with a scene of betrayal and the truth behind the final boss, whose sin is pride. Pride cometh before the fall, and in his pride, the second overlord set the entire game in motion, believing it impossible for him to lose. You see, the real wizard died when the heroes faced off against the last overlord, possessed by him upon destruction of his body. He orchestrated your resurrection and the corruption of all the heroes, encouraging them to indulge in their desires to the point of excess. His plan was to have you bring down all opposition and then kill you, retaking the throne with no one left to stop him, but his pride blinded him to the fact that putting you through all that would make you strong enough to defeat him. You know, give or take a quick intervention from your chosen mistress so you can regain the magic he ripped out of you with a wave of his hand. It's worth noting that the actual wizard was Rose and Velvet's father, not that he was a good one before he got possessed since he was never around, and I'm not really sure what other relevance this has to the story, but whatever. And so the evil overlord defeated the other evil overlord, and the land rejoiced. Rest in piss, old man. 
Honestly, it is wild that Gnarl gets to survive this situation, even if you are a low corruption overlord, and especially if you aren't. Now, on one hand, if you want to be a true villain protagonist, this game rests a little too comfortably on the comedy end of things and undercuts your villainy with the corrupted heroes you face that are worse than you in many ways. On the other hand, given that you are playing a hero left for dead by his former now corrupted allies and you can be more or less a heroic overlord, who is painted as a force of evil by the sinful heroes for making people's lives better by forcibly fixing problems rather than maintaining the miserable status quo. I don't know, given the last decade it just speaks to me. However, this doesn't mean you can't be an absolute bastard because to raise your corruption level to its zenith, you are more or less just indiscriminately slaughtering and pillaging your way across the land from the word go. Ahem. <clears throat> Killing innocent villagers either personally or by setting deadly creatures on them, ransacking the village of Spree and destroying all their houses, burning down the last of their wheat fields, keeping the stolen food for yourself and letting Spree starve, terrorizing Spree to the point that they offer up their finest maiden to be a walking temple decoration and or concubine, because what other reason is there to offer someone your finest maiden if it isn't so the allure of her titties will persuade them not to murderize everyone? Sidebar, this offering is made a joke of by the Maiden protesting that they don't call her Haystack Harriet for nothing, get it? She's a whore, actually, please laugh. Also, this offering doesn't work as intended because the Maiden breaks free and you then proceed to subdue and persuade, read Capture and Drag Away, ten women from the area to come work at the tower, with some remarking that you should take their sisters instead because of their beauty. They're later seen in the tower, dressed in sandals, miniskirts, and halter tops, whilst Narl leers and suggests that they feed him grapes. Cheating on Rose, who actually cares about you by swapping her out for her sister Velvet, who cares less about you and more about your gold. Setting fire to the last uncorrupted portion of the elven homeland, casually discontinuing the elves as a species by choosing to save a pile of gold instead of the last of their women from a collapsing fortress. I missed some, but you get the idea. An odd detail that stuck out to me while playing on Low Corruption was that the spells you receive up to that point are typically referred to with he, him pronouns when Narl explains what they do. But if you get the Low Corruption versions later in the game, he uses she, her. So evil spells are male and good spells are female. Why are we gendering spells, Narl? Are you trying to get posted on r slash pointlessly gendered? Back to the evil stuff, I'm absolutely not saying that the game shouldn't have any of this because the entire point is to be an evil overlord. I like the game. Hear me say these words. I like the game. It isn't like over-the-top line-crossing humor can't be done today, as some people like to complain, oh, you couldn't make a movie like Blazing Saddles today, completely ignoring that Blazing Saddles was very much made for the climate it was created in. A good example of this kind of humor, I would say, can be found in the Monster Prom games. The humor is very much tongue-in-cheek, weird, over-the-top, and often crosses the line just far enough to be funny again, but it never feels mean-spirited or pure in such a way that it becomes unwelcoming. It's time to address those weird heavenly gates. So yeah, gates to the abyss are cropping up everywhere, and it's the jester's doing because you shouldn't have kicked him around. And if you didn't, screw you anyway. <laughs> this script is already long, so I'm going to try and streamline this. Try. The first abyss is a dark mirror of Meadow Hills and Melvin Underbelly's personal hell where he is forced to eat until he explodes because he's a gluttonous fatty fat person and that's hilarious. We force feed him until he blows up two barriers, then roll his body into two more barriers like a pinball and finally play a brick breaker minigame where Melvin is the bull because Fatty McFadderson, obviously. Before we leave, he rolls into a pit he can't escape from, farts right before falling in, and the game jauntily proclaims he's on a new weight loss regime. Hardy har har, fat people are fat and gross, that's the joke, tee hee, peak comedy. 
We retrieve the Abyss Stone, which controls this corner of the dimension, and leave. Moving on to the Ebonite Abyss, we find a theatre playing out the downfall of the elves and learn that whoever is running things here is super not a fan of the Mother Goddess or the elves who worship her. There's also a, um, interesting design decision when defacing the Mother Goddess statue. Hmm. This level is mostly tedious. You navigate around backstage until you can manually control a rolly prop and get stuck on the geometry like I did. Get it into position and then just burn over onto ashes and retrieve the Abyss Stone. The more important detail of this level is that we learn more about the being who rules the Abyss, a theatrical entity who has a fixation with being remembered. And while Nal recognizes his voice, the recall isn't there. Strange. Onto the Heaven's Peak Abyss. All the women, except for the inn lady, have fled into the abyss because they are sick of the men's shit. And I do appreciate that when one of the men pleads with us to talk sense into the women, he sounds like a little boy crying for mommy, as that is honestly the kind of attitude you'd think would be non-existent and yet. So we enter to find the future that liberals want. <coughs> The women, sick of the men shit of constantly whining about why they aren't as supernaturally attractive as literal lust demons, are sitting pretty while men folk do the menial housework usually foisted upon women. We find Sir William and his sex cult burning in a pit, and stuff the perverted paladin into a cleaning device somewhere between a street sweeper and a pillory, and use him to clean up the slug we killed on arrival. Narl is mortified at being ordered around by women and encourages the Overlord to play along and sympathizes that he knows it's undignified, but that we need to lure this new kind of evil out of hiding. The new kind of evil being... <laughs> but no, I just find this funny because the Overlord canonically stays loyal to Rose and is therefore the Gomez to Rose's Morticia. He's a genuine wife guy, a house husband. What I'm saying is Rose pegs the Overlord. We continue doing tasks for the ladies, mowing the lawn, cleaning up the parlour, and eventually, in the game's own words, subdue the females and return them to the surface. Ugh. This is the only way to progress, by the way, and it's framed less in the way of subjugating other people is bad, and more so, oh god, woms in charge will mean cushions and flowers everywhere. The horror, oh, they'll put us in little leather outfits. Oh. Like, of all the evil shit you do and can just allow to happen, this is something you need to stop? Okay. After returning the women, you're congratulated by Nal for subduing them for all males everywhere, and that will move them out of their evil ways and into something small and insubstantial, only for Nal to immediately respond to a bell ringing as he's clearly bringing tea and biscuits to your mistress. Coming, mistress! The kettle's just boiled! <laughs> no, no, I, I won't forget the biscuits! Oh, drat! It's off the hook! Well, at least there was some self-awareness. And I know I touched on this before with the whole mistress situation and the sex scene, but why are the minions even interested in women, let alone human women? If you're going to make an entire species that presents as a single gender and they all spawn more or less asexually from life force filtered through hives, but they still seem to take pleasure in carnal things, the logical thing for them to be attracted to are things like themselves. What I'm saying is, if the minions and Narl should be attracted to anything, it should be men, but the writers were a bunch of heterosexual blokes who would have probably screamed at the idea, so rest in piss. Anyway, we retrieve the Abyss Stone for Heaven's Peak. Moving on to the Abyss for the Golden Hills, we find the dwarves fighting each other over it. Wonder what that's about. We enter to find that Goldo, the dwarf hero representing Greed, has found himself in a touch of Midas situation as he's punished to spend eternity as a golden statue, fully aware of everything but unable to do anything. Neat! We lure some of his own people over with a sack of gold, whereupon they proceed to hack his body to pieces, revealing the Abyss Stone from this area is buried inside him. So naturally, we lure a bunch more dwarves over until Goldo is completely broken apart, conscious the entire time. Let's not dwell on it. In the process of moving more dwarves over to him, however, we get a look at the master of this realm and he is a very long boy, but Narl still can't remember who he is despite definitively recognizing the creature from classes about gods and other such entities in his youth. Moving on to the Reborian Desert, we find the Infernal Abyss, which has to be unlocked with the Abyss Stones retrieved previously, making this one pretty final. We're attacked by an army of wraiths on arrival, and after surviving the gauntlets, we move on to a labyrinth where we have to set fire to hanging peasants in order to open the way, and they're kind of annoying and immortal like this, so it's 
a bit cathartic, I guess. On the other side of the labyrinth, we find Khan, who is... not doing great. We'll just move on from this. Entering a small temple area, we learn that this entity is known as the Forgotten God, whose name and memory is cursed to be forever lost. He was once the spouse of the elven mother goddess, but when she found him cheating on her, she cursed him to be forgotten by all and incapable of being remembered. Good for her. All of this was an attempt by him to break free of the abyss, but after a boss battle where we trick him into ramming the support pillars around his pit, we defeat and kill him. However, with his last breath, the Forgotten God damns us to imprisonment in the Abyss, and our way home is destroyed, the last to escape being our traitorous jester, who gives us a final salute before the portal is gone. The Overlord, now both the prisoner and master of the Abyss, is sworn fealty to by its denizens. He may be trapped, but he is now the new god of this place, and that might count for something. Back home, Narl laments that he had a soft spot for this particular Overlord, and the minions are sad about losing us, but they brighten up upon seeing Rose as the camera pans to show her swollen belly, and Narl remarks optimistically that, Well, evil always finds a way. Overall, I did enjoy playing this again. The minions are charming, the tone is good, and the gameplay is fun, barring a few tedious moments of padding. Thanks to its somewhat cartoonish style, the game has aged better visually than it might have otherwise, even if certain animations just aren't there. I would still recommend this game to people, despite its flaws. Hell, I did recommend this while I was playing it for this video. I told a friend about it because I knew as soon as I started that they would love the minions, and they've had a blast with it so far. It absolutely shows its age and dates itself with its sense of humor at times, but Overlord is still worth playing if you want to be a big bad Overlord of a stereotypical fantasy setting. Shoutouts to my patrons, who are all very handsome people, and if you would like to support the channel, consider becoming one yourself by following the link below. I know many of you will have followed me through my Warcraft videos, and I don't want you to feel obligated to stick around if this kind of content isn't your thing. I just want to say thank you for being here in the first place, and that I hope you have a great day. I will see you next time.